the Meshnaya firm, our sole contention is protecting electoral legitimacy. The winner-take-all approach of the Electoral College is a disaster for democracy. According to Andrew Prokop of Vox in 2016, nearly every state allots the electoral votes to whoever wins the state, regardless of their margin of victory. This means a 30% margin in New York is no different from a 5% margin, but the difference between winning and losing Florida by 0.1% is crucial. As a result, Nate Silver of 538 finds in 2016 that voters in the select few swing states that can alter the outcome have up to 48 times the influence of voters in spectator states. This is problematic because as Stanford professor Don Toza writes in 2016, candidates exclusively pour their resources into these swing states, having no reason to visit, advertise, mobilize, or pull the concerns of voters in states where they are comfortably ahead or hopelessly behind. For example, in 2008, a combined total of 0.25% of all election-related spending was funneled into 32 spectator states, while in 2016, candidates concentrated 94% of their events in just 12 battleground states, effectively ignoring 70% of the population. This will only worsen over time. Kyle Klondick of The Hill explains in 2016 that as partisan polarization has increased with each election cycle, the number of swing states have continued to decline. Whereas in 1960, states with less than a 5% margin represented 70% of electoral votes, they represent less than 30% today. A national popular vote is the obvious solution. As Koza explains, popular election of the president is the only system that by definition makes every voter in every state relevant. As a result, Charles Kaiser of CNN explains in 2016 that a national popular vote would restore true national campaigns with candidates focusing on all 50 states instead of the mere handful of swing states that have dominated every recent election. This has two advantages, both of which increase trust in the political system, and the first is increasing political participation. As Susan Page at USA Today explains in 2016, people in spectator states don't believe their vote matters as the outcome is already predetermined. Without a popular vote, a Republican in California or a Democrat in Louisiana declines to participate because their vote is effectively wasted. Thus, George Chung of Stanford projects in 2016 that a shift from a winner-take-all to direct proportional representation would boost voter turnout by up to 12 percentage points. This is crucial for political trust. As Victoria Scheibman of Princeton finds in 2013, voter participation causes the individual to believe that they have a stake in the democratic process, which is the single greatest factor in their approval and perceived legitimacy of democratic institutions. Second is creating representative platforms. As COSA explains, the Electoral College motivates candidates who pander to the segments of voters who are overrepresented in swing states. By contrast, in the vast majority of elections, presidential candidates have not even bothered to poll policy opinion in spectator states. For example, Andrew Gellman of Columbia explains in 2016 that because the five states with the highest voting power are disproportionately white, white voters have 16% more influence than blacks and a whooping 57% more influence than other minorities on the election's outcome. This explains why the past election saw a greater focus on white interests with far-reaching implications on post-election policy. More generally, COSA notes that battleground states consistently receive a wide variety of presidentially controlled favors ranging from funding to legal exemptions. A shift to a popular vote would end this preferential treatment, resulting in more representative policy. This translates into political trust, as David Smith of The Guardian writes in 2016 that both major political parties' failure to engage voters' interests on a nuanced level has resulted in record levels of disillusionment with the government. For these two reasons, Kaiser concludes that at a moment when millions of Americans doubt the direction of our country, the quick adoption of a popular vote is the single reform that could restore faith in American democracy. The impact is effective governance. According to the OECD in 2013, without sufficient trust in the government, support for necessary reforms is difficult to mobilize, particularly where short-term sacrifices are involved for long-term gains. Low trust in the 21st century has impeded motivation for change, ranging from education to the environment. Finally, blind to the UN concludes in 2006 that political trust is the main motor of good governance. Thus, we affirm. Actually, we can use it. Yeah, okay. We negate the resolution. Our first contention is increasing extremism. The Electoral College forces candidates to appeal to moderate voters. Benjamin Zeichner of the LA Times writes in 2004 that the Electoral College pushes candidates to the political center in order to win politically diverse swing states. Peter Braunitz of the Progressive Policy Institute confirms in 2016 that 57% of swing state voters consider themselves to be moderate. Thus, Stanford political scientist Boris Fiorina finds in 2014 that surveys of partisanship and ideologies show that the country as a whole is no more polarized than it was a generation ago. The popular vote will reverse this. 
Daniel, Daniel Butler of Yale University writes in 2009, the candidates face a trade-off between taking a moderate position that appeals to swing voters and an extreme position that appeals to their base voters. They will choose to turn out their base as a 2015 Gallup poll found that moderates make up only 34% of Americans nationwide. Eliana Johnson of the National Review furthers in 2016 that since 1972, a vast majority of candidates could have won the popular vote by only appealing to their base. Thus, Trent England of US News in 2012 writes that under the popular vote, candidates can simply go where they are already popular and fan the flames of political radicalism. The impact is economic uncertainty. Because polarization increases the difference in economic policy between different administrations, economics professor Ma uh, Marina Azamanti finds in, in September 2013 that polarization increases economic uncertainty, which reduces investment with a 64-point increase in political polarization index, resulting in a peak loss of 1.75 million jobs after six quarters and 2% lower economic output. Economics professor Kenneth Couch furthers in 2010 that empirically, as the business cycle weakens, black workers are the first to be fired. Our second contention is voting restrictions. Under the Electoral College, attorney Sean Rosenthal explains in 2015 that states that are tilted heavily to one side have no incentive to restrict voting rights because the outcome of their presidential vote won't change, and swing states are unable to restrict voting because their legislatures are divided. Thus, Bradley Jones of Pew writes in 2016 that only 10 states have the strictest level of voter ID laws right now. However, Sean Rosenthal continues that the popular vote would give Republicans in deep red states a powerful incentive to ramp up voting restrictions to affect the national totals. The impact is racism. Wendy Weiser, the American Prospect, explains in 2014 that voting restrictions such as voter ID, cutbacks to early voting and same-day registration primarily prevent African Americans and Latinos from voting, causing millions of votes to be lost every year. Empirically, Chris Ingraham at the Washington Post explains in 2016 that strict voter ID laws double the participation gap between whites and minorities, decrease Latino turnout by 10.8%, and decrease overall Democrat turnout by 7.7%. Our third contention is increasing the influence of wealthy donors. Under the Electoral College, spending is isolated in just a few swing states, keeping demand for donations low. Indeed, the New York Times reports in 2012 that campaigns have completely oversaturated the ad markets and reached the point of diminishing returns in key swing states. Thus, Max Galka of the University of Pennsylvania finds in 2016 that presidential spending decreased in 2016 when, and when controlling for inflation, income growth, and population growth, campaign spending has roughly flatlined over the past few decades. The popular vote changed this for two reasons. The first is a bigger market. USA Today writes in 2016 that the popular vote puts the whole nation in play, setting off a scramble for even more campaign money, leaving candidates more beholden to special interests. Second is a more expensive market. Ryan Beck with the Time Magazine writes in 2016 that candidates would need a lot more money to air ads and rent campaign offices in more expensive urban markets. The impact is creating distorted policy. Peter Enns of Cornell finds in a 2016 study that the more reliant candidates become on, on campaign contributions, the more that they try to attract donations by tailoring their agenda to the problems that donors prioritize. Lee Drummond of the Sunlight Foundation furthers in 2012 that while presidents pander to the voting pool during election years, when they take office, their promises quickly fade in favor of donor interests. Problematically, Sean McKelvey of Demos explains in 2016 that because of the top 500 donors, only 12 were people of color and only 8% of the money came from women. Donor influence is an impediment to all forms of equality, with donors condemning affirmative action, abortion, and economic redistribution. Empirically, Adam Leos of Demos finds in 2014 that campaign contributions created and continue to perpetuate mass incarceration, deregulated markets, and a low minimum wage. Single state, right? Yeah, that's why they have to adopt more moderate policies and better policies. That's just false. 
else. Like they, they can still increase money. Like people, oh, there are so many rich people who want to donate to campaigns. Yeah, they so can just raise more money. money. Yeah. It's like not that hard. Because yeah. the markets are oversaturated, so there's diminishing returns. Like right now, there's a trade-off for them between raising money and like doing other things, yes. even sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. And because the markets are oversaturated, they don't have an incentive to increase spending. Right. So but right when now, you have more markets and more expensive so markets, you need to right. raise that. So more. you're telling me that right, right now, right now there's like a lot of money in the system. If we prove to you that we decrease the reliance on money, do we win this argument? I don't know how you would do that. So we'll just, we'll do like it. That's fine. All right. Yeah. So yeah. you talk about this like increase in turnout, right? So yeah. why don't voters inspect interstate turnout right now? Uh, because they don't feel like it matters. Okay. So how often does a voter in a swing state swing the election? Like how often does their like one the vote actually matter? Their really? one vote? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean they know that they're in a swing state, right? If I live in a swing state, I know that my vote would really matter because in the okay. end, how does your vote matter if it's not the one that swings the election, which literally never happens? I mean, that's right? like the same question as why do people go into the lottery? Like the chances are low, but it definitely can happen, especially if you're in a swing state. Okay. Yeah. So can I have a question? And also, like if you're in a coalition or something, it helps to benefit like your party. Wait. Like what's, if you're if you're in like that? The, can you just explain that? Yeah. So like if you're in a group, then it helps your like your um the candidate that you're voting for win. Because Wait, what does that mean? Like if you're in a group, because if you're in a swing state, then even though like your one vote might not matter as much or has a very low probability, you can influence other people around you to also vote for you for like the same. Wait, so like basically you're gonna like talk to your friends. And then well, I mean, all it's vote? just like another reason if you wanted a reason. It's just like um, even though the probability of one vote to sway the election might not be extremely high, it's still really important in a swing state. Okay, so it's really important when you like talk to your 15 friends and then that's just like another reason. Stop. Yeah. Okay, okay, I have a question. Sure. Okay, so you talk about how like we have to appease to the bases, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so why is that not true right now? Why is that only true in a popular vote? So the argument would be that 57% of swing state voters are moderate, much less voters outside of swing states are moderate. So when you have a national campaign, you're appealing to more of those non-moderate voters. So why can't you appease to the bases as well? Like, why can't you try to get the votes from your base as well as get them from your moderates? You could, because, but the cards from our case, from Butler, says that there's a trade-off between appealing to moderates and extremists. I mean, you're still in the majority, base, right? You're but, still inside of your political party. So you can still have them turn out in the status quo. All you have to do is be a yeah, little bit more no, moderate. There's no policy skew, right? Because there's a trade-off between catering your policy interests uh -huh. to moderates in the base. Because obviously you can't have extreme policies and not extreme policies. I'm not talking about, issues, I'm not saying saying talk about politics. I'm just saying that in this sense, it's not unique Because they're still in a party. It's, still it's not non-unique if there's no policy skew. Okay. Weighing overview and then just responding to their cases. Are you guys ready? Do you pull the weighing on our case first? Uh, flow it. Um, honestly, flow it below our case because it builds off of our political trust impact. Okay. Yes. Okay. Is everyone good? Yes. All right. Let's begin now. Both sides agree that some kind of policy is important. That's why they're impacting to certain forms of policy, such as African Americans getting pro jobs programs, things like that. The most important link to policy, though, is going to be our impact about political trust. Because without trust, there is a prohibition on the passage of policy. Then in Rolex in 2012, and when there was a lack of trust in the political system, especially in the 21st century, there was empirically been declined to support for programs that help the poor, minorities, and generally programs that require short-term compromises from the rich and from people in the middle in order to help those at the bottom. That's really critical because raising trust creates the support for those reforms. But second and more importantly, trust also can Controls the link to a lot of their impacts like polarization. The reason comes from the Atlantic in 2016, which was that low trust in the 21st century has caused people to bounce back to their original political party and not want to work across the aisle because they don't trust the system dynamics in the first place. That's really critical because they are definitely also going to try to link back into our trust impact as well. But when weighing the two, you should always prefer trust because of strength of link. Because things like money in politics, polarization, extremism, and voting restrictions are already extremely high in the status quo, very low probability that they get worse. Whereas in our world, trust is at an all-time low, any marginal impact is a reason to vote for us. Let's go to their contention one about increasing extremism. When you guys are on the flow, we'll start with Drummond 16 of Politico, who explains that in the status quo, the swing state effect of moderating has become a myth in the last two decades. The reason for this is that now, most people who claim they are moderating in swing states actually overwhelmingly go red or blue. Only about 67% of people in swing states, according to NPR, are actually ideologically moderate, and more importantly, Drummond furthers that most of the people who are moderate don't even vote in the swing states anymore. It ends up people being on both sides. That's really critical because they find that there's been a reconfiguration of campaign strategy, where because you can concentrate so much money into a few 
select states, candidates have the ability to run a ton of ads that appeal to their base in that state, get their base to turn out, and then they win off of these identity politics. But when you nationalize the campaign, you can't concentrate resources, so you need broadly appealing platforms, which decreases this turnout politics that's happening right now and restores the politics of persuasion that leads to moderation. But then, go to their argument which says that since 1972, you could have won every single election by the base. First, this makes logically no sense. They can see that 34% of Americans are moderate right now. That means that neither respective base is enough to attain a majority. You have to swing the moderates in the country as a whole, so you would have to do so. But then second, and more importantly, Coso finds in 2013 that because both sides would, would initially be going for the base, candidates would recognize that the one that then goes to the moderate in the middle would be able to swing those with them, and by game theory, it would be in their best interest to be the one that goes to the middle. So if one of them is extreme, the other one will become moderate, and all the solvency exists. Again, don't buy their statistic from 1972 onwards if it's not backed up by a warrant. If we win the warrant, we should win the statistic as well, because every statistic is based on a number of underlying assumptions, and our logical warrants respond to those underlying assumptions. That's just basic debate in our view. Then, on contention two about voting restrictions. First, on March 16 of Yale finds that if anything, you would decrease the incentive for voting restrictions when you vote for the pro, because every state would want to be more represented in the national vote in order to have more representation in policy, so they would pass things like pre-registration and early voting to increase the registration, which helps minorities and everybody else. But then second and more importantly, media finds in 2016 that voter restriction laws would not have a very significant impact on during national popular vote, because unlike the 7% statistic they give you, meta-analyses of voter turnout from these things, uh, from these laws only show about a 1% impact, which is enough to swing a swing state, but not enough to Swing the national popular vote a lot of the time, especially if not every single state will pass the voter suppression law, so you decrease the incentive because you decrease their marginal impact. But finally, Johnson in 2003 finds that we prerequisite their entire impact about racism, because in the status quo, the electoral college is an effective gerrymander of black votes, because all black votes are concentrated in these big states that don't have any power, so it literally doesn't matter if there's these like, voter suppression laws, at least there is a chance that blacks can form a national voting bloc and create some kind of change, and then there's suppression and that block goes from 25% to 20%, that's still better than having no block at all. Go to their contention theory about money and politics. First, John Soros of Reuters finds in 2015 that doubling the amount of money in politics would only have about a 1% impact on the election today, and the reason is because money is super oversaturated in the status quo. It's very unlikely candidates can get more money because they're already taking all the money they want. But then, three turns. First, COSA finds in 2016 that if you geographically spread out the campaign, there would be a deconcentration of resources in swing states, which would A, not increase the amount of money, but B, more money would be able to come from grassroots organizations rather than super PACs. Second, Kellogg finds in 2016 two reasons why you would decrease money. A, candidates would get more free media coverage and appeal to voters that way, and B, because they want the moderate middle, they would adopt broadly appealing policy platforms instead of using the turnout wars, like I explained before, they conclude a 54% decrease in money in politics. For that reason, a strongly urge an affirmative ballot. Thanks. Yeah. We're going to take a look. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, which means any policy benefit of high turnout already exists. But third, there's no impact. Political science 
Professor Robert Stein found in 2002 that non-voters and voters have the same levels of trust in government, are equally engaged in politics, and have identical policy preferences. But then some terms. First, Leslie Francis of the DNC explained in 2012 that the popular would redistribute resources towards national media campaigns, stabbing funds from grassroots activities, which ultimately reduce voter turnout. But second, cross supplier connection three, the NYU Brennan Center found in 2012 that 26% of voters don't turn out because they think wealthy donors have too much influence and that this disproportionately hurts poor and minority voters. So if we went on connection three, we're going to be decreasing turnout. And third and finally, ads will be overwhelmingly negative, which is problematic. Albert Hunt of New York Times found in 2012 that more than 80% of attacks were negative, 80% of ads were negative. This is problematic because A, Richard Lau of Rutgers University finds in 2007 that negative campaigns reduce trust in government and decrease political efficacy, and B, Megan Kiesel of ABC News finds in 2012 that 85% of ads from outside groups contain misinformation, which is problematic because David Hauser of GMU writes in 2009 that after seeing ads with misinformation, voters are four times more likely to vote for low-quality candidates against their interests. But then go to their second point about skewed policy. The first thing they bring up is race, but first turn it or actually three terms, rather. David Damore of Bookings Institute finds in 2012 that there are four states, Colorado, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico, that are diversifying really quickly and growing in population faster than the rest of the nation, and they're some of the most geographically diverse states right now, or demographically diverse, rather. None of their evidence accounts for this. Their Gelman card is only about five states, but we say there's other swing states that are getting more diverse. But second, turn it. It's always easier to get a higher concentration of specific minority groups in certain swing states. Political science professor Kyle Kreider explained in 2016 that high concentrations of Latinos and African Americans in key swing states like Florida, North Carolina, and Virginia determine the of the states and ultimately the election. On the other hand, because not all minority groups have the same interests, they get diluted in the national popular vote, which is why Amal Ahmed explained in 2016 that the easiest path to presidency would be for candidates to focus only on winning white voters in a national election. But then third, turn it. Swing states are diversifying in the status quo. Mike Hudak of Brooklyn explained in 2016 that because every swing state is becoming more racially diverse, the Republican strategy of appealing only to white voters is a sure path to future elections, so ultimately, in the long term, we're going to be solving for this. Then they talk about like government perks. They don't have a single card that says presidential perks increase trust or that pres or decrease trust or that presidential perks are important in any way, so they don't get any impact on like swing states getting some slightly more funding. On our case, on our wealthy donors argument, the first thing they read you is from Soros saying that it only leads to a two, two like one percent increase in the election in the national popular vote when they uh, have oversats or when you double spending. The problem with this is this is in the status quo, which is actually our point. Swing states are really small markets, so they're already oversaturated. But in the national popular vote, you always increase the market, which means there's more money that can go in before it gets oversaturated, which means you increase the demand for campaign finance. The rest of their turns are kind of silly. First, they say they decentralize. Um, like money from swing states. The problem is, if you increase the size of the market, you will increase the demand for money. And finally, they even can kill it. There'll be free media, and they'll eat poll polls broadly appealing policies. But that study assumes that the amount of money they raise won't go up, but obviously it will. That's how they call it stuff fun, like their nationwide ad campaign. You ready? Yeah. Start. So you say that swing states are inherently fluid and are constantly changing, yeah. right? How have swing states changed in the last 50 years? Yeah, so like California used to be a swing state, now we're seeing like... the broad trend. Yeah, yeah, broad trend. So like New Mexico is now a swing state, that wasn't a swing state. How many electoral votes did swing states represent in 1960? It sounds like you know the answer 70%. How many did they represent now? It sounds like you also know the answer They've been decreasing. The reason they've been decreasing is this, and here's my question. Are minorities mostly affiliated with the Democratic Party, or are they mostly moderate? I would say they're mostly with the Democrats. 87% Democrat. When your minority population increases, you are no longer a swing state, because now you're a blue state. Then you stop being a swing state, and you are a previously red state. Right? If you're like, previously red state, like, the, the, the so, part that we read from here, Brookings says that like previously red states like Arizona, okay. New Mexico, those states that's have cool. low minority so, populations. When you increase their the population, they became swing states. So, so now they're swing states. Matt. Here's yeah. how we analyze this, right? Mm -hmm. The current swing states are the ones that are closest to 50%. Right, fifty percent red, white. Oh, sure, sure, right. Sure, yeah. And the current swing states are the one where whites are overrepresented. So the uh, equilibrium point for where no, you like fifty like fifty Mexico, have an Colorado, overrepresentation of whites. Arizona are all current swing states. So, like your card just doesn't account what? for those. Like those are those are current. I mean, maybe not Arizona quite as much, but like New Mexico and Colorado are like current swing states. Yeah, and I'm saying that when like, you aggregate the swing states, very recently, I'm saying when you aggregate the, the swing states, states by voting power, the relative no, impact so, of the state and the relative so impact of the voting power only talks about more white voters. Wait, your Gelman evidence only talks about five swing no, states. No, no, no. He talks about all of them, no, but he no. highlights five because he has the five. His data well, only comes from five. That's, that's not fine. true. That's, that's not true. The Vox article talks about five because those are the five with the highest probability of swinging the actual election. His data is only about five. His data is only about five. But that, They're the five like, with the most impact. Okay, so you say like we're going to be decreasing uh, or creating a more broadly appealing base under the, the, pop, the yeah. broadly appealing platform under yeah. the popular vote. Like why would this be? Why? Because yeah. 
the majority, or not the majority, but the plurality of voters, or very close to plurality, are, as you say yourself, not aligned with one major party, at least in the country as a whole. So you can't win by just getting your base. Yeah, but, that's but, not but that's not comparative, right? Reason, in swing reason. states, but wait, that's not comparative. Yeah. In swing states, more voters are moderate. Right? So, so here's, like, the, thing. here's if, the difference. Yeah. The reason that doesn't matter is because of an over-concentration of resources in swing states, oh. those people do not even end up turning out because the right. campaigns that they run there are turnout and ad wars that only appeal to their bases. Wait. Independent turnout right. has been declining right. in swing states okay. as a result of that. But, but, That's why okay. Trump won. But if swing states have more base. moderates than the national election, it seems like that would be more base turnout or like more base catering in the national election. Right? No, the reason I'm telling you that like, what is that you, just, I'm yeah. saying it's literally impossible to run the kind of campaign you run in a swing okay, state so, where you're spending 400 times more so, than any wait, other state. That, that, that just says 99% of the money. 99.75% of the money. Right now. Like, of course, because they're not spending other states. But my question would be if they wait, raise they're spending, like, they're spending like $100 per vote there. Like, it's absurd. Yeah, if they're it's not sustainable they, for 50 I would states. say if they raise more money, can't they also just appeal to the base in all 50 states? I'm like, telling what evidence do you have to read that that I'm giving you two reasons that won't happen. A, it's a lot easier to do the platform approach, and B, and more importantly, if both go for the bases, the one that also does the platform is the one that's going to win. One of them will always win by getting the people in the middle. the swing states too. Fine, then maybe your argument's not unique. Use one thirty. Thirty left. Remember that right now, uh, red and polar states are extremely high right now, but there's a low trust that means that our impacts are going to be a lot higher because you're not going to see any impacts on red and polarization. They talk about tangible impacts, but look back into the education poverty thing I just talked about. Then go on to our first point on, uh, on turnout. The turns that they have here are basically just extension based on our case, so I'll go back to that later when we go into their case. We go to our point on representative platforms. They basically say that four states are diversifying right now, and they try to indict gentlemen, but gentlemen actually counts for every single swing state, don't believe they're indicted, but furthermore, remember, there's no percent of rate or change, so they don't even talk about that at all. It's best to replace it in the status quo, but furthermore, even if they do diversify, they're not going to be swing states anymore. That's why we tell you in case that swing states numbers are going to be decreasing. 
Then they talk about how Florida has a huge minority population. Remember Gelman again, that only counts for one state while Gelman counts for all the others. And Gelman tells you that in swing states, whites have 57% more influence than others, which means that minorities are not being represented for. But then like some code that says that swing states are uh, get a lot more fears from the government. They say that the programs are really important, but the emergency and disaster relief from the government, such as Flint, Michigan, water prices, is really important, especially because Michigan needs to be becoming more of a swing state. Except Kaiser and Kaysen tells you that the popular vote is the only thing that can restore faith in the American democracy, especially right now because there is very low trust. And remember, trust is very low, which means you have a high magnitude impact. And finally, the OECD that says with low trust, so we're going to be seeing decreasing reforms, especially the ones with short-term sacrifices, which is the ones, uh, ones that we need right now. Then go on to their case. The first thing we want to extend is COSA that says that neither basis have enough, part, uh, enough voters right now. That's why it's strategic for the candidates to go to the moderate party. That's going to be a huge turn. But then on voter restrictions, we extend the uh, syndicate that says that there's going to be a decrease in incentive voter restrictions by increasing registration. But furthermore, remember, there's no impact on the national election because it's like a huge population. Voter restriction laws are only effective when you have state voter restriction laws. That's going to be another turn. But then on donors, you remember again that, uh, that COSA tells you that there's going to be a decrease in uh, money from super PACs, but we need more money from grassroots because that's a lot more strategic. And remember that they have to adopt more moderate strategies instead of relying on money because you have to look at all 50 states. Remember, money's not going to be a huge issue when we look at all 50 states. Rather, the politicians actually have to be good and be moderate. So when they talk about how there's going to be a decreased demand for money, the role of money changes itself, but they don't need that much money anymore. They extended, then back to their case, then back to our case. If that makes sense. Start on the first term on our, on our first contention from Toza who says that you have to go to the middle, but they never prove that this is unique. This happens in both worlds, you have to go to the middle. We have evidence that says that 57% of people in swing states are moderate, so they have to this is completely not unique. Then they extend this medium card that says that there's like no impact from voter restrictions on the national election, um, so you're gonna like turn that somehow. But they don't prove how like in specific states it has an impact on the election, the status quo. So they have no offense here. Remember the Jones evidence says that only 10 states have strict voter ID. Please don't vote for them here. Then go to their case. We're gonna be extending a lot of turns. The first one is on their turnout wing from Francis, which says that on a national scale, it's not feasible to have grassroots campaigns. So these decrease, which decreases turnout. This is key because they argue that turnout is the link to trust. So we are the best team that links you to trust on this drop turn. Another way we link you to trust is on the hunt turn, which also gets dropped, which says that 80% of ads are attack ads. And you have to increase ads on a national campaign because now every vote matters, you increase attack ads. This is important for two reasons. First is the drop wow analysis, which says that this decrease is trust when all the candidates are doing are attacking each other at every stage in the political process. We link into trust better than they do because this is clean drop. But second is the Hauser evidence, or the sorry, the key segment is first, which says that 85% of this is misinformation. And the Hauser evidence which says that this leads to four times lower quality candidates being elected. This is key because they never respond to the framework analysis that Matt does in his last speech, which is that representative policy is the most important. If we show that candidates vote for the wrong candidate that doesn't represent their interests, we clearly win the round here. This gets dropped. Then three more turns that are dropped. The first is on Crider, which says the specific swing states determine the electoral college right now, but that doesn't happen in our national vote where they become so, such small of a portion. Additionally, is Hudak, which says that in the long term, the electoral college is diversifying and actually protects minority interests. They never respond to any of these arguments. They just say that like right now, Gelman says that swing states are whatever Crider says, that this specifically protects minorities and is not part of the popular vote with the analysis that they do. 
Finally, on our case on wealthy donors, they basically concede the link to the New York Times editor says that campaigns are oversaturated in the status quo. They never respond to the links to say that it becomes a bigger market and a more expensive market, so we're going to be in increasing campaign spending so you can extend the Drummond um, evidence as an impact. This is that presidents have huge policy skew. Even if they win their whole case on turnout and trust, if the president is only responsible to campaign donors, then they're not passing representative policy. Mm -hmm. When we say money is saturated, you guys say it as it's saturated in some states. We say it as they're just getting all the money they can get. Mm -hmm. My question is this, logically, if I'm offered money or if I'm at a fundraiser, do I not take every dollar I can get? So here's the problem. If there's no demand for that money, then there's no policy. Wait, wait, that's enough you. Forget demand. Is no, no, there no, no, a demand right okay. now? This is, really, this is our yeah. argument, is that demand is what causes the policy skew. Because it's not like you get 10 bucks from a donor, or I guess 1,000 bucks, and you're like, all of a sudden you want to cater to them, right? The you reason, don't need the money. Guys, the, no reason, no, the reason, the reason, this, this is an important explanation of this argument. Let me just finish. Uh -huh. The reason why policy gets skewed is because if you need that $1,000, then you have to create policy pro that donor in order here's, to get that Here's money. the thing, though, right? When you're in a swing state, and there is effectively boundless demand, because both sides are engaging in a turnout war with one another, just to see who can get the other side it says more. that swing states are oversaturated. They're past, it says literally past the, the point of diminishing returns. It says returns. they're oversaturated to the it point says of diminishing returns. We're at the point where like it doesn't actually diminishing pay. returns like on, on money. So yeah. they're like past so the point of diminishing returns. So every next dollar does less for you. So yeah. le there's less. There's less because they're only state. taking literally every dollar they can get. Right. But there's no high. There's no. There's low demand. Yeah. So there's no policy skews. I'm not saying there's low demand. I'm saying there's also low supply because we literally yeah, had but, unbounded but demand. The argument's not about the supply. The argument's about the demand. Right. Like even if here's the thing. Even if the supply stays the same, right? If they like. If there's the same amount of money in both worlds and candidates it. demand it more, they will skew their policies no. more to attract more this of that money. Bad, 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 bad. Think of it this way. Yeah. Has money increased in the last 20 years? According to Galco, would you control for inflation yeah, and no. population spending? No. It's okay, increased because fine. the supply is increased, but the demand has stayed the same. Sure, sure, sure. Money has stayed the same even. The number of swing states has gone down. So even though the number of states they need to care to, they were still taking more money in that process. No, Why is that the same. case if the demand was fixed? The state, like the because the same. people, but they're doing it for less states, if right? If super PACs are like, more hey, money I'm going to run an ad for you, yeah. no one's going to be like, no thank exactly. you, I'd rather not have more yeah, ads. But, that point. but the they're not going to skew policy. Okay, so at least you're dropping your ads turn then, because that relies on it like skewing policy, but not having Wait, what ads? Return about advertising, right? Super PAC says, I'm going to run an ad for you. You just conceded they would take it either way. Right, but right now it only happens in swing states. Under yeah. the popular one, it happens nationally. So it's it expensive. It's not going to eventually purpose. happen there. Advertising, we would contend, would still happen. Wait, wait, wait. How many ads have you seen in San yeah. Jose? Your whole, whole evidence is about, your whole like, stop, okay. top of like the legitimacy contention is just about how like swing states are the only states that matter, so they don't like campaign anywhere. Like, so, I would say the same uh, thing applies to ads. going back to what Jake said, though, if a campaign is going to run an ad for you and people don't say no, why does the increase in money matter? Like, why would they not be beholden if they're running? You're the, one who said, you're the one who says the supply stays constant, which means there's a set amount of money, and right now, like they don't have to demand it that much because they have enough money on both sides. But so, you agree like, that they're already saturated saturated it regardless. Markets. They take it, but they don't need they it as much. Policy. So yeah, if, but there's, if they're already if, beholden, if, no, like, if, if they're, they're, they're already like, super beholden, why does that hurt them? And why would they not it, choose like, to give more portfolio projects to people who give them money? So our because it only matters if you want the money. The, it doesn't, the, the Wait, policy doesn't just happen. Not true. Like, it, you're, 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 the policy skew doesn't happen. I mean, the policy skew doesn't happen. The policy skew doesn't happen. The policy doesn't happen. The policy skew doesn't The policy skew doesn't happen after they get the money. It happens before they get the money in order to attract the That is definitely not true. Rich that people call in favor so of politicians sense. after they give the money. That's what's happening. That's what they're making. That's what they're making. All right. That's logic. Okay, 30 seconds. Yeah.
five steps down. Their first contention, the only thing he says, is that our codes are trained about going back to the middle is not unique because they're already doing that in the swing state. They don't respond to the analysis we give you from Jutman and logically that in the status quo, because of the over concentration of money and resources in swing states, it's actually possible for candidates to run turnout war there and simply get their base to overwhelm the result. That's exactly what Trump did, which is why he got elected. That's why Obama didn't become super moderate. He carried through his liberal message. That's why in the last 20 years we haven't seen this moderation trend anymore. It is a myth. At least when you spread out the money, it is literally impossible to run the kind of campaign you run in the swing state nationally, even if you have marginally more money, like 25%, something like that. You can't spend $100 per voter, so instead you have to adopt broadly appealing platforms because they can see it in both swing states, but also the rest of the nation. The majority of voters are independent, at least in Swift, at least in the rest of the nation, they're actually going to try to get those voters. That's really critical. It's going to take out a lot of the responses to our case. But then, on the third link about money, they just say that logically it's more expensive, logically that causes policies to you. We tell you a couple of things. One is COSA, who brings that because you increase the geographic breadth of the campaign, more of that money can come from locally organized grassroots. The money is no longer coming from super PACs, therefore the impact does not exist. They do read a card in response to RK saying grassroots is not feasible, but I kid you not, Matt did not give a single warrant for that in his summary speech. We give you a warrant, geographic breadth. The second thing we tell you is that again, money wars do not work under a national popular vote. That's literally what the Kellogg study concludes. Even a 25% increase won't cut it, and as a result, they adopt broadly appealing platforms, which then decreases the amount of money by 54%. Most importantly, policy skew is already happening to the greatest extent right now as a very marginal impact, prefer our impact, but is a much greater probability of creating some kind of change on our case about racism. This is really critical. One, they say that you decrease grassroots campaigns with no warrant. I respond to that. Second, they say that ads are bad. Ads are really concentrated right now in the swing states. In a national popular vote, ads will not be an effective strategy to get the entire majority. That's why Kelly tells you that we're going to change that and you're going to use more grassroots. And they tell you that these swing states are becoming more diverse. Remember the Hill who says, when you become more diverse, you're no longer a swing state. In general, when you account for voting power of swing states and the population, you see 16% more power of the black, 57% more power in general. That means that they win over these white voters appeal to those blocks. Then not only one is a like independent reason to vote pro because we're deconstructing one form of oppression, but two and more importantly, it links into trust and trust is a more substantial impact in the long run because it decreases support for policies that help people at the bottom. For this reason, please vote pro. in summary, and they don't respond to that. And then, go on to their case. They like respond for the first time to these two turns in first final focus. They say that just basically there's no warrant that we're going to decrease ads. The warrant, which Jake explains very clearly, is on grassroots campaigns, there's no effective way to grassroots campaign in an entire nation, which is why the easiest thing to turn to is nationwide ads that will affect everyone. That's the only way to attack, mi affect millions of voters at the same time. This is really important because the Francis card, which they drop until first final focus, turns their entire case on trust because it says it will decrease turnout when you decrease grassroots campaigns, and that will ultimately decrease trust because they say that themselves in their case. But the second thing is on the hot card, which says that 80% of ads are going to be negative. This is really important because they say that ads will go down, but they can see it in the entire case that ads right now are only in swing states. So when you increase nationwide ads, obviously they affect more voters and have a bigger effect on decreasing trust and other things. Like first is the loud card, right? It says that when you have negative ads, you decrease trust because they're just attacking each other. It doesn't seem like a good political system that turns their entire case because now everyone has less trust in the, in the government, not just the swing states. But second is the Kaisel evidence, which says that 85% of those ads are going to be negative. And this is really problematic because they never respond to the Hauser card that says when you see a negative, or sorry, not sorry, the Kaisel evidence doesn't say negative ad, it says misinformation with that. They have lies. And the Hauser evidence says that when you see an ad with lies, you're four times more likely to vote for a, quality, a low quality candidate that is against their interests, which means even if they like increase trust, candidate, people are voting for the wrong candidates, would make policy ultimately not representative. The final thing they talk about is like this 
Gelman card about how five states like make it more representative. The problem is first, it's only about five states. Like it's not holistic. You can call for the evidence and statistics are only about five specific states. But second, if they drop the Hudak evidence, says that those states are diversifying really quickly in the status quo, which means like in the long term we solve, and if anything, eventually it's going to be a turn because it'll overpass the national average. But finally, like their terminal impact is about trust, but they don't impact like any of this to trust. They don't explain the link between like the Gelman card and trust at all. So ultimately, we're winning the round.